I beg to move that a humble address be presented to Her Majesty as follows. Most gracious Sovereign, we, Your Majesty's most dutiful and loyal subjects, the Commons of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland in Parliament assembled, beg leave to offer our humble thanks to Your Majesty for the gracious speech which Your Majesty has addressed to both Houses of Parliament. Mr Speaker, despite the fact that this is quite possibly the most terrifying thing I have ever done, <laughs> it is of course a great honour as the re-elected re and proud member for Chatham and Aylesford yeah. to move. Yeah. Yeah. The speech is usually a gift reserved by the whips for those thought to have had their best times. <laughs> the chief, a man well known for his elegance, charm and wit, <laughs> has clearly clocked its panto season. So for asking me to do this is the equivalent of shouting, your career is behind you. Mr Speaker, I think we could do a bit better than that. And frankly, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> frankly, Mr Speaker, I feel a bit more reassured if indeed the Prime Minister could perhaps join in. <laughs> Chief, a man well known for his elegance, charm, and wit, has clearly clocked in his panto season. For asking me to do this is the equivalent of shouting, Your career is behind you. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> I said, it's you shall go to the ball. <laughs> Instead of Cinderella. Come on, Instead of Cinderella or Puss in Boots, let us raise the literary tone and note that today is the anniversary of A Christmas Carol being published in 1843. Now, Charles Dickens was a son of Chatham, and so this old has-been speech clearly makes me feel like the ghost of Christmas past. The member for Warsaw North will presently play the ghost of Christmas future. And the Prime Minister is oven ready for the role of Christmas present. Now, Scrooge. <laughs> now, Scrooge would have been brilliantly played by the former Chancellor, Philip Hammond. <laughs> but was sadly pipped to the part by the last Speaker of this House, who auditioned powerfully for the role for many a bleak year. <laughs> Old Marley sits on the front bench opposite, chained and regretful. <laughs> and that's just about Arsenal's recent performance. <laughs> Smile, Jeremy, <laughs> won't kill you. <laughs> but who, Mr Speaker, who is our tiny Tim? So valiant and small, the object of universal pity. It could be none other than the Right Honourable Member for Westmoreland and Lonsdale, for whom we welcome back to the House and wonder if he'll have another go at his party's leadership. He's not here. Now, I had thought, I had thought, Mr Speaker, of continuing the Love Actually election theme by delivering a speech on bits of card with the parliamentary choir singing carols in the background. But one, we are not allowed to bring props into the chamber. Two, I think Hugh Grant has suffered enough. <laughs> simply impossible to fit all the names of the new Conservative intake. Yeah. 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 Now I note that the last Kent MP to have proposed the loyal address was Bob Dunn, the long-serving member for Dartford, who started his speech by mentioning that he had been returned as a member in four successive <laughs> general elections and at each election the Conservative vote had been significantly higher than the time before. Well, thanks to this Prime Minister, I now know how he feels. <laughs> this legislative programme outlines plans for a bill authorising the construction and operation of High Speed 2, but it was that Queen's speech of November 1994 that the legislation for High Speed 1 was tabled. Along with his constituency of Dartford, High Speed 1 travels through mine and many others in Kent. He spoke of its potential virtues, predicting the economic benefits associated with it, and he was right. 
Thanks to that bill 25 years ago, there are parts of Kent that have seen major regeneration thanks to a much reduced travel time into London, and there is still even more potential to unlock. <coughs> Now, I'm privileged to be the member for Chatham and Aylesford, a diverse constituency with a strong naval history. A friend and mentor of mine, the member for North Thanet, mentioned to me earlier this week that he's now the only Kent MP to have been serving while the Chatham Dockyard was still operational. But then rumour has it he's also the only Kent MP to have been here when the last Thanet MP <laughs> proposed the Queen's speech in 1937. <laughs> 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 Alas, the Dockyard... Sorry, um, <laughs> Alas, the dockyard, while not within the boundary of my constituency, has always been of critical significance to the town. It ceased operations in 1984. However, its regeneration has been remarkable, paying tribute to its heritage through housing, employment and tourism. Now, another female member of the 2010 intake to have proposed a Queen's speech is, of course, my right honourable friend, the member of Portsmouth North. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like Chatham, her constituency is built very firmly on the foundations of the Royal Navy. And, of course, she famously littered her speech with bits of the male anatomy as a dare from her colleagues in the reserves. <laughs> now, I thought I would seek her advice, given I know that I would feel sick to the core and shaken with fear whereas she herself has shown great calmness and tranquility during tough times at the highest level. She looked at me, she took my hand, and she said, Tracy, you'll be fine, just don't cock it up. <laughs> <laughs> now, I note that the last humble address to take place after a December election was proposed by Mr Reginald Mitchell Banks from Swindon, Hansard notes that he delivered his speech in court dress, a tradition I am grateful no longer exists. Shame. Although if Hansard wishes to note that I'm wearing high street chic, they are, of course, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Banks spoke of the importance of trading with our friends abroad and, of course, the bonds of commerce and enterprise between the United Kingdom and those countries both near and far have only strengthened since. The famous Watling Street, a trading route used by ancient Britons, Vikings, Saxons and Romans, runs through Chatham, and it was on that road that ba famous battles were fought against Roman invaders. But I'm delighted to say that things have changed, and it's on that road today, now known as the A2, along with the M20 running through Ellsford, that goods come and go from the port of Dover, which, as the Foreign Secretary now knows, is a rather important trading point. <laughs> years on from that election and its subsequent humble address, we have proposed legislation that by delivering on Brexit creates new and exciting trading opportunities and it starts in this house tomorrow with the withdrawal agreement. Yeah. This bill will unlock and unleash Britain's potential with the rest of the world alongside other pieces of Brexit legislation announced this morning. We stand ready to build a new relationship with our friends in the EU and elsewhere based on free trade and cooperation. <laughs> And then thanks to the legislative programme put forward today, we can raise our own standards in areas like agriculture and, of course, my own personal passions of animal welfare and the environment. The reintroduction of the Environment Bill will protect and restore our natural environment for generations to come, set ambitious, world-leading but achievable programmes to tackle pollution and enable us to make the most of our much-loved landscapes. For those of us with densely populated, polluted constituencies, with its large pockets of green space, under threat from inappropriate and strategically ill thought through planning pro proposals, demonstrating that these fields not only provide a haven for wildlife, but a breathing space in urban areas that enhance health and well-being of our residents is our last remaining hope. But as well as other extremely important pieces of legislation, I know from my campaigning throughout the election, my constituents will warmly welcome plans to enshrine in law increased funding into the NHS, greater access to GP appointments, fairer funding in education, more police officers and tougher sentences for serious criminals. They will also be delighted to hear a further commitment to supporting those with poor mental health. Members of this House, including myself, have spoken powerfully and personally about their own brushes with various mental health conditions. It is right that we help remove the stigma around mental health by talking about it, but it is action, not words, that matter. And so it's paramount that we ensure that our constituents, whose voice may not be as loud as our own, receive the treatment that they need by guaranteeing that we treat mental health with the same urgency as physical health. Yeah. Yeah. 
I was proud that our manifesto included commitments to improve the overall well-being of the nation. And while there may not be in the legislative programme outlined today, measures such as investing in grassroots sport, enhancing physical education in schools and reform of the out-of-date gambling legislation, the Prime Minister should know that there is wide cross-party support for such improvements to begin their laborious whitehall process, and I hope they will do so soon. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I made my maiden speech during a debate on poverty. Part of my constituency suffers enormously from deprivation, and I work alongside many organisations to support those who find themselves unable to cope. Charles Dickens chronicled vividly the poverty of Victoria Britain, inequalities which were alleviated in the ensuing 180 years by moderate, enlightened governments of all colours. Mercy and altruism must remain our mission in today's One Nation Conservative Party. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have worked with many MPs from other parties in this House on various issues. And of course, I welcome and congratulate my new colleagues on these benches, but there are friends opposite who I will miss enormously. Yeah. And although we have not covered ourselves in glory for these past few years, new MPs will soon discover that this place is at its best when we work together and relationships yeah. and friendships will yeah. be formed over issues that need cross-party consensus if they are to progress. Yeah. Chatham's hero, Dickens, may have been a great social reformer, but he also observed that there is nothing in this world so irresistible as laughter and good humour. <clears throat> Perhaps it would be no bad guide for us as we repair this House of Commons in the coming months. Let laughter and good humour replace recent rancour. Let friendships thrive through adversity. And let us respect our differences, but not let them divide us. Yeah, yeah. And of course, let Tottenham finish above Arsenal in the league. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's a given. <laughs> <laughs> So as I finish my humble offering to Her Majesty, may I take this opportunity to wish colleagues and all the hard-working House staff a very Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah and a peaceful holiday season, and in the words of Tiny Tim at the end of A Christmas Carol, God bless us everyone. Yeah.